good day to all of you. Today in this lecture series, I'm going to uh, do the physiology of neuromuscular junction transmission, which is very relevant to neurophysiology. Now, when you talk about neuromuscular junction, what is it? Let's look at a little bit of anatomical aspect of neuromuscular junction. It is a modified synapse, okay? Why I'm saying it's a modified synapse, usually a synapse occurring between two neurons. But here, there is a motor neuron in one, uh, in one end and the other end, you have a muscle fiber. So that is, uh, that is why we call it is a modified synapse. So it is between a motor neuron and a muscle fiber. So now when you look at this neuromuscular junction, I think you have to have a clear idea what are the basic components of a neuromuscular junction. It consists of mainly three components. The first one is you have a presynaptic membrane, okay? And then you have synaptic space or a small cleft. And then you have a postsynaptic membrane that is usually known as motor in plate. So usually, presynaptic membrane is usually invaginated and it is uh, known as synaptic gutter or synaptic trough. And synaptic space is usually about 20 to 30 nanometer uh, space, which contains large quantities of acetylcholine esterase enzyme. And then postsynaptic uh, membrane, that is I told you earlier also, it is the motor in plate, skeletal muscle fiber, and it has lots of holes of muscle fiber in it. And you have subneural clefts. So in this picture, the subneural clefts are clearly shown. Can you see the subneural clefts? Okay, so subneural clefts are these clefts, small uh, hole-like things. Okay, right. So clearly, if I say again, this is the presynaptic membrane or the presynaptic component, neuron. You have the synaptic cleft, which is about 20 to 30 nanometer uh, sized. And this is the postsynaptic uh, membrane or the motor in plate, which have subneural clefts like this. All right. Okay. So you have, so you can see lots of acetylcholine esterase enzyme within the synaptic cleft. And then we will move on to the major neurotransmitter of the neuromuscular junction. Usually, the major neurotransmitter at the neuromuscular junction is acetylcholine, okay? Right. Now, with that basic uh, idea, basic structure, now we'll move on to the synaptic transmission. How it is going to transmit? Now, action potential begins in the ventral horn of the spinal cord. Usually, in the ventral horn of the spinal cord, you have an action potential, right? Then what will happen? Inside the neural membrane, there are dense bars. Can you see these dense bars in the cross-sectional area? You can see clearly these dense bars. These are known as linear uh, dense bars. And each side of them, you have calcium channels. Calcium ion channels are located in each side of these dense bars. Okay. And can you see there are some vesicles? Okay. These vesicles, can you see? There are lots of vesicles which have acetylcholine in it. Okay. Right. Now, local depolarization. Now, with the action potential coming through this uh, local, this uh, presynaptic neuron, it comes and depolarizes and opens the voltage-gated calcium channels. Once the presynaptic membrane is going to be depolarized by the action potential, it opens the voltage-gated calcium channels. Then what will happen? Calcium ions will diffuse in and they exert an attractive effect on the acetylcholine vesicles. Okay? Right. So can you see? Now we have uh, either side of the dense bars, you have the calcium channels. Okay? Right. So when the calcium ions, this presynaptic membrane is depolarized, you will uh, attract calcium ions to the calcium channels into the presynaptic neuron. Then what will happen? Can you see these new these calcium ions, right? And they will come and lodge like this in the presynaptic membrane. With that, 
there will be attraction, right? That process is known as docking process. Attraction of these vesicles, which are filled with acetylcholine, will come and dock, right? Dock means they are coming and lodging on the presynaptic membrane. And they are fusing. They are fusing with the presynaptic membrane. So there are lots of processes going on here. You can see uh, calcium ion, uh, ions will be uh, taken in. And then what will happen after depolarization, calcium channels will be open and the calcium ions will be taken in. And with that influx of the calcium ions, you have docking or attraction of these uh, acetylcholine field vesicles into the presynaptic membrane. And they will come and dock on the presynaptic membrane and they will fuse with the presynaptic membrane. Then what will happen? After that, they will be exocytosed. That means the process of exocytosis happens after the fusion of the vesicles. So who are going to be sent out through this process of exocytosis? Acetylcholine. All right. So acetylcholine now will go and enter into the synaptic cleft. So within the synaptic cleft, it will go and they will travel to the postsynaptic membrane. So after it comes and lodging on the postsynaptic membrane, it will attack with the acetylcholine receptors on the postsynaptic membrane or the motor enclave. Then what will happen? After exerting the effect, acetylcholine will be degraded by the acetylcholine esterase enzyme, which are uh, seen abundantly in the synaptic cleft. All right. So now the, the things I have already told you using the diagram, now I have put into words. You can see, right? Draw them to the neural membrane near to the sparse fusion of the synaptic vesicles with the presynaptic membranes, then empty acetylcholine into the cleft by exocytosis, then acetylcholine bind with the small acetylcholine receptors which are on the muscle fiber membrane called acetylcholine gated ion channels, which are located immediately below the dense bars, okay, which are corresponding to these dense bars in the presynaptic neuron. So, this is actually a acetylcholine uh, molecule. You can see that. So, this acetylcholine receptor, if you see uh, acetylcholine, sorry, it was a acetylcholine uh, uh, receptor, okay? It is a protein complex. It has five subunits, two alpha, one beta, one delta, and one gamma. That's how it is being made. So, it is a uh, big protein complex, okay? So, when acetylcholine binds to its receptor, what will happen? So, now acetylcholine goes and binds in the acetylcholine receptors located in the postsynaptic membrane. So, sodium channels will open up. There are sodium channels located. Those are known as acetylcholine gated sodium channels on the postsynaptic membrane or the motor enclave. So, sodium influx occurs into the muscle fiber, causing local positive potential change inside which is known as in-plate potential. So it creates action potential that spreads along the muscle membrane and causing a muscle contraction. Okay. So in-plate potential, this is a graded potential. What is the, Now we have learned that uh, there is in-plate potential is being created in the what in-plate node. So what is this in-plate potential? This is a graded potential. Now once this reaches the threshold level, Action potential is generated at the postsynaptic membrane. Okay. So, that is known as in plate potential. Now, I told you earlier also, now after doing its function, acetylcholine, which is released uh, to the synaptic cleft, will be released and stays for a few milliseconds at the cleft. So, after binding with the receptor and exerting its effect, it is rapidly removed by two ways. One is most of them are destroyed by the enzyme acetylcholine esterase, as well as others diffuse out of the synaptic space. Now, I told you acetylcholine esterase is present in the synaptic cleft and it will hydrolyze the acetylcholine into choline and acetate. Okay. Choline part is reuptaken by the presynaptic terminal to make more and more acetylcholine within the uh, vesicles hereafter. It's like a cycling process. So, and also another small thing for your interest, you should know acetylcholine is also found not only in these presynaptic neurons of the 
uh, neuromuscular junction, but also in the red blood cell membranes. Okay, right. Now, so far we have learned about the neuromuscular junction with regard to skeletal muscle. No? So, what is the difference between uh, neuromuscular junction with the smooth muscle? Usually, with regard to smooth muscles, neuromuscular junction is not well developed. Okay, and uh, they will not depend on motor neurons to be stimulated. You know that, right? They are mainly dependent on autonomic system. However, motor neurons of autonomic system reach the smooth muscle and can stimulate it or relax, right? Uh, depending on the neurotransmitters which are being released, like noradrenaline or nitric oxide, like that. Right. Now we have learned uh, the neuromuscular junction and we learned the neuromuscular junction transmission process. What are the major components of the neuromuscular junction transmission? Now we will just look at the drugs which are acting at the neuromuscular junction, which are very relevant to your clinical applications. Now, there are many types of drugs which act at the neuromuscular junction. Uh, there are different types, okay? First one is uh, muscle fiber, which are the drugs which are stimulating the muscle fiber by acetylcholine-like action. They behave like acetylcholine. And the next one that will stimulate the neuromuscular junction by inactivating acetylcholine esterase. Then you have abundance of new acetylcholine. And then drugs that block the neurotransmission, neuromuscular transmission at the neuromuscular junction. Okay. So first we will see the drugs which will stimulate muscle fiber just like acting or behaving like acetylcholine. As an example, methacholine, nicotine, those have same effects on muscle like acetylcholine. They are not destroyed by polyesterase. That is the most important thing. And uh, then some drugs, I told you, they will inactivate acetylcholinesterase. Commonly used drugs uh, like neostigmine, physostigmine, stigmine groups, right? They will inactivate acetylcholinesterase in the synapse. Therefore, with each successive impulse, acetylcholine is accumulated in the space. So what will happen? Acetylcholine... Uh, will now repetitively causing muscle contraction even with a few nerve impulse. Okay, that is the action of uh, acetylcholine esterase inhibitors. So, these are, however, reversible choline esterase inhibitors. So, they inactivate the enzyme for a few hours. After that, these drugs are displaced. So, enzyme again being active. This is used to treat myasthenia gravis, which is a neuromuscular junction disorder. Okay, so if we have ptosis and lots of problems with that, your neuromuscular junction transmission is being slowed down. Therefore, when you are topping up it with using more and more acetylcholine, that uh, clinical features can be uh, relieved. Okay, then I told you another group of drugs which will block the transmission at the neuromuscular junction, such as curariform drugs. Okay, I think you may have heard about arrow poison. Okay, uh, that is a very uh, common one, common poison, which was used in olden days, okay, uh, as arrow poison. So, curare was the one which was used. Uh, so, based on that phenomenon, nowadays, we have different types of anesthetic drugs, okay, like tubercurare, and tubercurare. Uh, they can prevent passage of impulses from nerve endings to muscle, okay. So, this d tubercularin is actually in anesthesia used as a muscle relaxant. Uh, it is used an adjunctively in anesthesia to provide skeletal muscle relaxation. Okay. Right. So, now you know different types of uh, disorders, different types, of, different types of drugs which will act on the uh, neuromuscular junction. So, it is very easy now if you know the process of the neuromuscular junction as well as the drugs which are acting at the neuromuscular junction, it's easy to combine the physiology with your clinical practice. Okay, right. Then we will move on to a small uh, clinical scenario that is uh, myasthenia gravis. Now, I told you if your physostigmine, neostigmine is used to treat myasthenia gravis, okay. What is this myasthenia gravis? Because when you learn the word neuromuscular junction physiology, right, you should actually learn uh, different disorders which are related to 
uh, those concepts. So the most important one is myasthenia gravis, which is an autoimmune neuromuscular disorder. Uh, what is the phenomenon? What is the presentation? It leads to fluctuating muscle weaknesses, okay, and fatigability on sustained or repeated activity that improves after rest. So mechanism is the inability of neuromuscular junction to transmit enough signals from nerve fibers to muscle. So that means they, they develop antibodies against acetylcholine-gated sodium channels. Therefore, end plate potential on the muscle fiber is uh, not very strong. They are too weak because you don't have uh, enough action now. Right? They are uh, not enough to stimulate the muscle fiber. Therefore, muscle contractions are very weak. Okay? So what will happen? The whole mark of this disorder is fatigability. They are progressively weaker during periods of activity and improves after periods of rest. Muscles that control usually eye, eyelid movements develop ptosis, drooping of eyelids, and facial expressions are especially, those are the susceptible areas. Okay? You can see uh, before treatment, he has drooping of eyelid. You can see this right side eye. But after treatment, he has improved. Okay? So... Treatment, usually you can use anti-acetylcholine esterase drugs, as I told you the process. And uh, what is the action of these drugs? They will increase the availability of acetylcholine at the receptors and our mainstay of the treatment. Okay? Right. Okay. Now we have done uh, uh, neuromuscular junction. We have learned the neuromuscular junction transmission. We learned the structure. And uh, we touched uh, upon small uh, aspects, I mean, simple things about the drugs which are acting at the neuromuscular junction, as well as we learned a disorder which is commonly related to neuromuscular junction transmission, that is myasthenia grams. Okay, so I hope that uh, this will uh, improve your physiological knowledge on neuromuscular junction transmission. This is a very uh, brief overview. Okay, so see you soon with another lecture. Till then, goodbye.